Hello there, you join me again today with a, a repair video on the Marconi 2955A radio test set. Uh, this test set um, has a number of self test fails on it. Um, if I just run you through what the tests it fails on are, we'll just uh, let it run through its test and while it's doing that I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Um, so basically it's failing um, a number of points around the low frequency level output and um, it fails about three tests out of the whole of them. Now I've looked in the service manual and uh, I'm going to go into next what those failures are and what these uh, codes mean here. So that's the end of a test there. We can see that it's failed on test 1 test 2.2 .2 and test 2.3 with those error codes. Uh, now what I've done, um, if I can just go back to return there, what I've done is I've um, got the service manual uh, for the test set and uh, we've got some information contained in the service manual which tells us what these tests mean so this is for example test one and all the parameters there um, regarding what those tests are and it tests them at different levels at low and high frequencies at different frequencies at 20 megahertz and all these other frequencies on the sig gen output and uh, it does this uh, on a number of tests test one two and three and it gives you the codes um, just to quickly summarize what those codes are um, is the codes mean um, for example code 1 test 1 code 11 is the 20 megahertz test frequency it says it's a high frequency that could be because you can't measure it for example uh, test 2.2 code 25 is 20 megahertz signal low power and co two, test 2.3 Code 27 is 20 megahertz signal low power as well. So basically, um, just to give you a little technical rundown of what uh, I've, I've managed to ascertain so far, is uh, this board here deals with the frequency counter of transmit signals that are coming into the test set. Uh, this is a DMOD board, this deals with all the modulation side of things. Uh, the transmit power side of the test sets measured on the other side with an RF attenuator um, and then fed to a digital processor which reads the TX power etc. Uh, this board here is really the heart of the instrument. This is the board which deals with the um, frequency generation and this board uh, deals with the low frequency uh, aspect up to 200 megahertz as well as the final RF amplifier stage for the whole frequency range of the instrument. Now how this instrument works is uh, believe it or not the signals generated by just three oscillators primary oscillators which are indicated here on the diagram and uh, which are physically on the board these three cans, these are the three main oscillators and what these do, these produce a frequency um, uh, as you can see there a fundamental frequency from 165 MHz to 260 from 260 to 400 MHz and obviously then um, from 400 to 500 MHz or uh, 510 megahertz there and then what happens is they use um, doubler circuits then to attain the second how uh, the sorry the first harmonic which is twice the fundamental frequency so we can switch these doublers in um, and obviously do the same here and we can double up and double up so, you know, the first harmonic at 400 MHz is 800 MHz, 
etc. So you get the picture that how it doubles up the frequency and thus we get the the different frequency ranges here and the outputs of these and these are switched in via the digital circuitry depending on what we enter in on the keypad for the frequency of the signal generator and then what we have when we look at this section here is uh, again we have some filtering and dividers for different frequency outputs but we also have a 200 megahertz fixed frequency oscillator and one of the interesting things on this test set how it works is the low frequency signal from 0.4 megahertz 400 kilohertz um, obviously right up to 80 megahertz isn't derived directly from these oscillators here these three main oscillators how it derives that is it uses a mixer um, which is this section here and so what we do is we, we generate a signal um, coming in from what is the output of these oscillators and we mix that signal with a local oscillator signal which is on the board um, and that is a fixed frequency oscillator running at 200 megahertz which mixes with this um, signal coming in to then produce um, the output between 0.4 megahertz to 80 megahertz and that then is how it derives the the low frequencies below 80 megahertz now one of the issues that we've got with this test set or the prime issue is the fact that this low frequency section isn't working properly so the other frequency outputs are all working fine um, but this bit isn't so the, the fault lay in these areas so these boards are um, AA4 um, boards and then obviously it's all contained on the same PCB um, which is, is this board here this is the board where the fault seems to be now what I've done, I've done a bit of digging before making this video and uh, basically the top and bottom of it is is that we have um, on the circuit diagram here just to quickly go through what has been a lot of uh, routing around and, and diagram finding etc uh, when we need to select the low frequencies um, that are on the range of 0.4 megahertz to 80 megahertz we have to divert the RF path and the frequency generation comes in from the frequency generator board across this link here and then there are diodes which you can see are dotted all over which switch the signal path in different ways so if we're going between 80 megahertz to a gigahertz for example where we're not doing any mixing the signal gets fed straight to this thick film amplifier amplified up passed down to the next section amplified again via these amplifiers and these two final amps before being sent to the 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 front RF socket uh, which is on the on the front of the instrument now if we want a signal below 80 megahertz what happens is the frequency coming in here is obviously in excess of 165 megahertz because it needs to mix we have a local oscillator of 200 megahertz which is what I've just showed you on the diagram which is here in this area and then we have the mixer which is this little boy that's the mixer this is a phase lock loop circuitry for the um, for the phase lock loop for the 200 megahertz fixed frequency oscillator which mixes with this signal in here to then produce what is the 0.4 megahertz to 80 megahertz output and then that's obviously fed off now there are logic levels that come in through this connector here into this board which tell um, a number of transistors which are highlighted here to switch DC levels on and off to this oscillator uh, they also switch on and off different diodes in order to switch the RF path in a different way to route it through the, the circuitry 
and so basically that's how it operates um, as a signal generator now the issue I've got here is that I've, I've done some tests using my test equipment and this fixed frequency 200 megahertz oscillator isn't running at all so hence it can't mix the incoming signal here in the mixer to then give an output a low frequency output below 80 megahertz now uh, these two transistors are the main oscillator that's the main oscillator transistor and it's Veractor diode and then this is the buffer amp which then feeds the 200 megahertz signal out to the the mixer we have a tuning capacitor up here which is C79 and that chooses as a center um, locking frequency if you like of the oscillator and no matter what you do with the oscillator you can't you can't get it to run um, now if we go back to the diagram a moment this is a uh, diagram of the oscillator and uh, this is the phase lock loop circuitry and coming in to the um, circuit here we have a 10 megahertz reference signal which is fed in from the 10 megahertz crystal oscillator frequency standard within the test set and this is divided by two to give a 5 megahertz output which we we get on TP1 there, which is what I can, I can pick that up. And this in turn then, uh, as you can see here, is, is fed into a, a differential amplifier. And when the oscillator, which is in this section here, is running correctly, uh, we get a, a signal output of 200 megahertz um, fed out the oscillator it's been amplified and then the signal enters the mixer which is that silver can I've, I've pointed to there and the two signals mix together the, the signal from the um, other board which has been amplified which comes in between 165 megahertz to 200 and something mixes with the signal here the 200 megahertz and the difference between the two is then fed out here which is a 0.4 megahertz to um, you know 80 odd megs so that's the signal path there now <clears throat> I'm not getting a signal coming out of this oscillator at all there's nothing coming out of it but the output of the buffer amp um, of the oscillator is sniffed and that's fed back into um, what is the phase lock loop the divider and phase comparator circuitry so we have a 5 megahertz um, frequency standard coming in here obviously if this is running at 200 megahertz this gets divided down and down and down until the output is going to be around about 5 megahertz here for it to be in lock it has to be at 5 megahertz both of these for this to be in lock as a phase lock loop now the output of this phase comparator um, produces a control voltage which controls the frequency of the oscillator via the Veractor diode here. Now this Veractor diode changes its frequency characteristics depending on the voltage that's applied here, the DC control voltage. And we have a loop filter because obviously this is giving a pulsed output and it needs to then be transferred into a smooth DC control voltage so depending on what frequency this oscillator is running at whether it's running high in frequency or low because it free, it's a free running oscillator until there's control voltage applied here if the oscillator is running high the pulse width modulation coming out of here will change proportionately um, to where it thinks it needs to pull the oscillator it needs to pull it high or low it'll change the voltage here proportionately so it'll it'll it could swing minus voltage for a moment and then go to positive voltage depending on what territory this has entered into uh, but either way once it's got the oscillator under control and the frequency coming out is at the desired frequency then these two inputs match in frequency and the output remains constant and obviously with temperature changes and other influencing um, measures that, that may take place such as screening cam proximity um, heat um, you know me bringing my hand close to the circuit for example 
can all affect the oscillation of the, of the oscillator so it would then any differences will be compensated for and then re-controlled so it keeps the oscillator locked in a in a controlled loop now this dc control voltage isn't changing and when i tune c79 which is his tuning cap nothing's nothing's happening now how it controls this oscillator and switches it on and off is that there's a transistor switch here which is these two transistors and uh, the DC conditions on these transistors uh, they are they're fed via a minus 12 volt supply and then we've got the IF range logic signal coming in which effectively switches these transistors on and off so when we select a frequency below 80 megahertz this transistor switched on for example and it provides a minus 12 volt supply rail um, via these capacitors which are on the supply rail which I'll speak about shortly via these resistors to the um, transistors in the oscillator circuit again via another 1k whatever resistor over to this buffer amp but it doesn't just do that it also provides an output um, for other things such as biasing the pin diodes and such like to get those to switch on and so we also have a as part of this logic signal switching the power on the minus 12 volt rail to the oscillator because we have supply voltages on the transistors which are plus 12 volts uh, to both transistors but we also the, the emitters if you like of the transistors and the oscillator is fed to a minus 12 volt supply and so without that minus 12 volt being present on this rail then the oscillator doesn't run and similarly the IF input signal comes in uh, this is a logic level either 1 meaning plus 5 volts or 0 logic 0 which is 0 volts also switches on this transistor this has a supply rail as well of plus 5 volts and that in turn um, switches on various things it switches on an IC here divide I think and then it also goes to provide bias into pin diodes to then bias the pin diodes to switch signal paths in a different way and so you know we've got the thousand megahertz low pass filter so that's uh, again that frequency to a thousand megahertz and we've got the different signal paths that are switched on the output you see now what I found on this um, is we appear to have a short circuit on the um, transistor which controls the um, DC supply the minus 12 volt DC supply to the oscillator and what I've got is I've got a um, this transistor when we select a frequency below 80 megahertz this transistor's switched on so the minus 12 volt supply is passed through this resistor this 22 ohm resistor R50 and is then supplied via these capacitors uh, these three capacitors to supply this rail now incidentally while testing round here for the voltages because I have a supply voltage there to the collector this transistor and I also have a supply voltage there to the collector that transistor I then started looking at the minus 12 volt line and I noticed that when the frequency below 80 megahertz was selected there wasn't any um, any voltage but in just trying to find R50 on the board I just happened to move this transistor with my finger uh, just to try and see the legend on the board for this resistor and I burned my finger on this transistor and it was very hot indeed so there appears to be a short circuit on the output of this uh, switch now this can only switch about three maybe four hundred milliamps maximum before it goes fizz bang and um, 
it seems to be um, very hot this transistor if it's hot enough to burn my finger then there's something wrong I doubt that um, judging by the the resistor values of a 1k8 I think it is again the same there these wouldn't be able to draw enough current if there was a fault condition in these transistors for example to cause such heating at that level and um, naturally the current flow that's coming out of this is a near short circuit because I'm not getting any voltages so I'm drawn now to these capacitors so we have an unpolarized capacitor uh, probably a polyurethane or a um, ceramic uh, we've also got what appears to be two polarized capacitors but because this diagram has been copied that many times the detail as to that is uh, is quite limited there seems to be a uh, a little plus sign there so I think these are either tantalum or electrolytics but looking at the values of them 320 I think that's a 320 microfarad don't know what that one is and the diagram which is on the on the PC as well that I copied this off when I zoom in on it I can't I can't really pull the detail out so I don't know what the capacitor numbers are for those uh, but on the board um, this is uh, if I just get some more light so that's uh, TR6 uh, that's R50 which is the output and then uh, I think there are these capacitors across it before it makes its way up to the oscillator circuitry up here now I can't see any evidence of any charring or burning and because I can't physically tell what capacitor uh, these are, I'm going to look at some values shortly when I get the instrument on its back but we've got various capacitors all over um, normally tantalums go short circuit so I'm going to be looking at that more closely um, but again that's the DC switching transistor that switches the minus 12 volt supply these are the phase lock loop amplifier circuits and that's then obviously the, the oscillator, varactor diode and tuning capacitor for the centre frequency of the oscillator, mixer so I'm, I'm going to have to take the board out and trace the track from R50. Now I could, if I wanted to, just lift one end of R50 and then we would we would just be isolating by lifting um, R50 up at one end we would just be seeing if this 10 nanofarad capacitor was shorted out. I doubt that's going to be shorted. I think that it's... I don't think it's going to be the, the one end there either and I think it's going to be these polarised caps I think these are um, these are tantalums or electrolytics but I think they're tantalums these and I think they're short circuit or there could be some other short before these resistors so yeah quite interesting so uh, I'll come back to you very shortly. I'm going to uh, whip this board out and uh, remove it, which is going to be a bit of a job desoldering this link, then removing all the binding posts and getting everything out, and then we'll uh, we'll have a look see whether we can trace the fault. So um, I shall be back with you very shortly. Right, we're back. We've got the uh, board out the the test set now, and uh, what I've uh, found <coughs> is that the transistor which switches the minus twelve volt supply uh, to the oscillator, the two hundred megahertz fixed frequency oscillator, um, has definitely got a short circuit on it. Um, what happens is is that the uh, transistor output um, goes up this track to this capacitor here, this ceramic cap and then on the other side of the board there's a, a link across which goes to this R50 
Um, the output of R50 then is fed up a rail which goes to this electrolytic capacitor here. Um, then it keeps going up the board then right the way up to uh, what is the um, through hole point here which then connects to this diode. Now my suspicion is is that um, either this is short circuit or we've got a problem with this capacitor here. Now if I flip the board over we've got the uh, the transistor um, sits down in the uh, let's have a look let's get my bearings so this is the um, supply rail which goes to the uh, transistor I can just find it oh there we are yeah it's that that thing there so the electrolytic capacitor across the 12 volt rail is, is across these two points uh, that's R50 bridging across uh, this is the capacitor there that junction where the um, land on the top from the transistor goes across and solders on the top side to the um, ceramic cap which sits across here then goes into R50 leaps across R50 to the electrolytic and then carries on up to that through hole which then on the other side is a track going to a diode which goes in this area now I can only find two capacitors the electrolytic capacitor and then the ceramic capacitor which is across here but according to the circuit diagram there's actually three capacitors now have a look here um, unless I'm reading the diagram wrong we've got a capacitor here uh, which if we leave the that's the capacitor that's before R50 which is that ceramic I pointed to this is R50 and it comes out we've got what appears to be a 1N which I can't find one of these capacitors is the electrolytic or it's showing two here and I can only find one and then it seems to go directly up to this what what would be a uh, I assume it was a diode it's probably a resistor special resistor but the um, I can't find this these other capacitors um, unless they're leading off on other tracks you know if it's a, a triple layer board or something which I don't think it is actually but it could be but um, yeah so you know we're leaving what is TR6 goes across to that capacitor which is C85 I believe or 88 sorry let's have a look yeah C88 so it uh, goes across to there, that land, and then soldered on the other side then to connect across over to uh, over to this resistor. Now, if we fit board over, and we where is it? Just find it again. I think it's on this side. There we are. Look. So that's the the land where it goes through across the capacitor then we've got R50 starting and then we've got the electrolytic capacitor before it then disappears to this through hole which the through hole being here that's the through hole um, just there and then that goes up to this resistor. I don't know why I said it was a diode, but it's a, it's a resistor anyway. Um, and then it, it goes there. So we don't have, unless um, I'm missing something, um, we don't have, you know, any other capacitors. So, no. 
does seem a bit strange, uh, unless the diagram's been revised and they've, you know, there were perhaps revisions, other revisions of this board. I mean, it's um, probably, you know, revision three or something with the look of it, perhaps. But yeah, so the next thing is now if I um, attach a, a scope. Um, a multimeter across that capacitor the uh, electrolytic which is here um, there's a short circuit a dead short 0.2 of an ohm and no matter which way around you measure it across those two uh, connections there so if the electrolytic's gone short which I seriously doubt or it's one of the ceramic caps maybe so I'm gonna lift R50 one end of R50 now and then I can find out with the shorts before R50 or after on this on this line, and then um, I'll come back to you in a moment and see what uh, what that is. But basically, um, if I connect, because obviously this is a negative rail, um, if I connect up, let's have a look. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit more. onto our 50 uh, so we'll look here because this is a minus um, 12 volt supply and then we'll just uh, connect that to there that sprung off which is never helpful let's try the other side <laughs> now interestingly enough I think that's a 22 ohm resistor so I had the fault of being on this side of the resistor where my probes connected to now and between there and the transistor uh, when I was measuring it across that capacitor there which is C69 um, it would have measured 22 ohms would the short had that short been after R50 um, in this in this portion in the in this area had the fault been there obviously me, me measuring across the capacitor this is a 22 ohm resistor. It would have measured 22 ohms because that would have been like connecting a 22 ohm resistor across the probes. But if I go to um, put my uh, positive lead now on there, I've got my continuity meter on. So if it's a short circuit, it will uh, it will beep and. Um, We are actually measuring 22 ohms. Um, so if I just zoom back to where we were, right, we're measuring. So we've got an open circuit at the moment. When I put the probe on, we're measuring 22 ohms. So that establishes the fact that what we've got there is we have uh, the 22 ohm resistor and we've got our probe, um, our multimeter um, connected between there and what is obviously um, ground there. So, had the short circuit been in this path here, through this area, then we would have got a zero ohm short um, to, gr to ground. But because we're actually measuring 22 ohms, as you've just seen on the multimeter, means a short circuit is after this resistor. So we've definitely got a, f a short on this line somewhere. Um, so what I'm going to do now, now that we've established that, is I'm going to try and remove some of these capacitors. I can only see two in the circuit, which seems to be uh, this electrolytic. Um, so I'm going to remove that and examine it, see what's uh, what's what's going on. But I'll come back to you in the next video very shortly. Right. 
Well, I've uh, removed the capacitor, uh, that electrolytic, this, and um, we'll measure the, the circuit again. So we turn it over, and this time we'll connect back to R50. And uh, what we'll do. I'll just see whether we can uh, zoom in a bit better. So, looking at the uh, negative probe side up to uh, the multimeter up to the output of R50 or the input, whatever, like we were before. And this we will connect to uh, what is the, the chassis. Uh, which is the ground plane area uh, so we can connect onto onto this chassis area to measure between there because the ground plane which is the um, negative part of the or the positive go inside of the capacitor connects to ground on the board which is that land there and uh, that's all part of the metal work which is here as well so at the moment uh, much improved result um, if I just come back out again and look at the big monitor I've got connected up to the test set we can see there that we've got an open circuit and uh, I'll just put it on ohms and basically we're we're open open circuit on that one which is brilliant news now well obviously we weren't getting that before we've got a, a short circuit now I've removed the offending capacitor and what we will do we will connect the uh, meter up to it and uh, we will measure it. Um, so we will connect the negative, negative to that side, and then positive to this side on the other thing. If we can get the damn probe to uh, go on it, just bear with me a second while well, I physically connect it it's only a small capacitor and it's quite tricky right so we've got the uh, capacitor connected and uh, we've actually got a, uh, a short circuit a 0.1 ohm short circuit now while I'm talking to you if I measure it the other way around as well Switch the probes the other way around, which I can do on the front of the test set instead of messing about trying to select the component. It's still the same. So that's quite a, an odd uh, occurrence, is that? The fact that uh, we've got a short circuit on an electrolytic capacitor, and yet uh, when we look at the capacitor, there doesn't seem to be any sign of um, of any failure, physical failure. So doesn't appear to be any leakage or anything. Seems to be okay. It's a a Wacom 220 mic at 16 volts. I'll have some of these in my parts drawer, I'm going to get uh, get them out next. And there's no bowing at the top, no um, gassing off, nothing. Just a complete short circuit. And it's not as if the metal can packaging is touching the terminals either. As it's uh, splayed out, there's no, no reason why that should be short circuit. So, very odd indeed. It must have dried out. And uh, and then just gone short, which is quite a surprise. 
Um, I know it does happen, I've had these kind of things happen before, but normally it's the tantalum capacitors that go and um, not the electrolytics. The normally electrolytics just go, uh, the ESR changes on them so that they, they don't perform as a, a proper capacitor as the correct value rated rated capacitance and so normally they just basically um, go up and circuit really but um, very strange short circuit so we will replace that and I'll come back to you shortly with the uh, replacement in and we'll do some more measurements right so we've uh, found our box of uh, capacitors uh, which I've I've got a number of them so we're in the 16 volt range um, it was a 220 microfarad so somewhere in this little pot we've got some capacitors which I'll uh, install and solder so it's worth keeping little boxes like this of electrolytic capacitors if you can be bothered to spend the time of sorting them out into different voltages I tend not to bother putting the capacitance in different things as well I mean you can do if you've enough space but you end up having component drawers all over the wall which I've got here anyway and you, you you get to a point where you just run out of wall space when you look at all the different values of resistors capacitors transistors you know you name it you just it just goes crazy so I have these little boxes with compartments and what I do is I just go by the voltage so it doesn't matter what voltage, uh, what capacitance they are, they all go in the same um, drawer for the same voltage. And that way then I have a range of capacitors um, that appertain to that voltage, all the different capacitors values in the pigeonholes. And, uh, and that way I can just quickly sort through. I only keep small amounts really in each pigeonhole. And then the rest surplus stock that I might have I then box up and keep in my stores so that when I run low on these I can go back and, and replenish what's in the compartments because I have seen people that just go mad storing stuff and uh, you end up then as a said running out of wall space you've, your components drawers on the wall fill up quickly and then you've too many components and not enough drawers so that's just a, a way I organise things right I'll be back to you shortly when I've uh, bumped one of these 220 mics in and uh, we'll see what happens Right, we're back. I've uh, replaced the capacitor with a Philips one, and uh, we've definitely got a better quality capacitor in there now than that was there before. And uh, nicely soldered in. So we are uh, we are ready now to do some more measurements. Just to check that uh, everything's fine, then we'll bob the board back in the um, radio test set. And uh, I just want to tell you as well, while we're on the subject of uh, soldering desoldering components, uh, I've had this Pace ST45 soldering iron for a number of years, and it's been quite a good uh, soldering iron um, with the with the soldering iron bits and everything that uh, I've got for it it's you know it's a very good uh, good iron I must admit um, now I've been quite fond of paste stuff for a number of years I've got the paste desoldering stations as well but uh, a few years ago I was quite fortunate really and uh, I managed to buy this uh, for a lot cheaper than any of the paste the paste soldering gear is very expensive uh, you know you pay many hundreds and hundreds of pounds um, just for the desoldering uh, system which I've got a couple of them on the other bench um, which you'll see in other videos that I do but I decided I'd buy one of these um, cheap sort of Chinese um, things and I think uh, one or two people on YouTube have done reviews of these and um, I found the desoldering station to be very good it's um, got a little cartridge thing which you can clear out when you press that trigger this comes out you can get rid of all the solder that it sucks up but uh, for getting electronic components out and sucking all the solder off the legs without all the messing about of using solder braids like you see here 
and scratching the um, enamel off the boards and other things it, it really is a godsend and um, I thought I'll splash out uh, to buy uh, one of these and um, the only thing I don't like about it is that the power switch is on the back and it's not on the front um, but this is like a, a Chinese um, version of what would be one of the more expensive or popular brands like Pace for example or others like Hakko but uh, that's the power switch there that's the only objection I've got about this but do you know it works really really well and uh, they're getting they are quite cheap on uh, on eBay I think it's called a Katsu or something like that yeah Katsu um, made in China and uh, it is quite a good piece of equipment I fully uh, fully recommend these if ever you go I've had this for about uh, since about 2017 and we're now in 2021 and I've used it quite a lot you know it's a it's a very good uh, good little little unit so um, you know don't dismiss uh, this kind of kit I mean it's uh, it's quite a cheap um, alternative when you compare it against you know what are mainly the mainstream um, things but it's uh, I'll just show you the front powered up it's always difficult working one handed with a camera but basically I've just had it on because I've obviously soldered this uh, board but you know it's, uh, it's got quite a nice uh, little flashy light on the front and uh, I found it quite easy to maintain it came with all the tools and everything to clear the uh, the nozzle out in the end uh, that's up there that little hole in the in the nozzle sometimes gets blocked on all of them including the paces and they, they come with all the tools and the different nib ends for different size components and uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised with the quality of the stand as well you know the uh, metal stand and and it was quite well made really so uh, I fully recommend uh, anybody wishing to buy these and obviously it's got a nice mode as well if you haven't used it in a while left it switched on it switches itself off the heater and then when you do want to use it uh, it then turns back on and comes back up to temperature you can set the the temperature and the limits and all sorts of uh, features on it so yeah just a little quick rundown that's all of uh, of that as I say I've seen videos I think on YouTube where people have put the power switch at the front which I recommend but um, yeah so quite a good piece of equipment if ever you want to buy one of those it's got a filter in here as well air filter it's, it's well well made I must admit so uh, I shall be back in the uh, in a moment when we bob the the board in the test set and we've uh, done some more measurements right we're back uh, we've got the um, uh, board back inside the test set and uh, we've switched the power on um, I've just been doing a quick alignment of the uh, tuning of a 200 megahertz oscillator it appears now to be working um, just using my scope probe I'm just gonna loosely couple um, to this oscillator just to tune this C79 for a peak output um, I'm going to set the RF frequency um, on the test set to uh, something like 5 megahertz just so that we get that oh it's already on 5 megahertz that's good just so that we get the logic switch which is here uh, which turns on the minus 12 volt supply uh, via this cap obviously up to the oscillator any frequency that's inputted beyond 80 megahertz higher than 80 megahertz will switch that transistor off and thus this 200 megahertz oscillator will be dormant so in order to perform any measurements with the 200 megahertz oscillator you have to um, switch on the transistor by inputting a frequency in the RF gen 
below 80 megahertz. I've chosen 5 megahertz here. Okay, so I'm just going to go um, and loosely couple um, onto the top of the transistor. Uh, we've got a BFR90 there, transistor, um, which this capacitor here uh, tunes uh, the centre frequency of this oscillator. So rather than load the oscillator by going on a particular pin, I'm just going to touch the top of the transistor so that there's inductive coupling at RF frequencies between the junction of the transistor and my, and my probe. And so, as we can observe on the spectrum analyzer in a moment, when I uh, zoom back out again, I should be able to observe a signal, and we want it as near on frequency as we possibly can. Um, so if I just go to the junction of the transistor, we can see that it's um, wandered off a little bit. We want 200 megahertz frequency, and so I just need to adjust the uh, oscillator frequency now in order to uh, attain the the right levels and and frequency accuracy. So what I'll do is I'll connect the probe up in the circuit. Um, if we go back to the circuit a moment and turn it the right way around, what I will do is I will probably go to C79 or the uh, chip pin I might go to um, I think it's pin number 3 on IC10 which is a clock input that's the output of the oscillator or alternatively I'll go to C79 and get the uh, another one might be uh, the junction of R25, that might be a better connection point. So, um, because obviously, is it R35? 150 ohm. I'm not sure if that's R35 or, uh, or not. It's almost impossible. Could be anything, that. Uh, the other one is... R207, I suppose. Um, R07, R06, R7, R6, or R. I think that's 35. I'll have a look on the board for that, see if we can find that. Let's have a look. Um, I think it'll be up at the top end here somewhere. Probably around that mixer area, I think. So let's have a look. There's R15. Uh, that's the oscillator transistor. That's the buffer transistor, I believe. Uh, I think. That's C70 there. And uh, I'm just trying to fathom out where the uh, that's R18 that's R7 and I think that might be uh, that looks like it connects to a diode I'm just trying to find what I think to be the, the right resistor on the output because um, obviously they're connecting to what will be the mixer? There's R15 there. I'm not sure. Have a look at R17, R16. That's the trouble, you see, when uh, circuit diagrams are being copied that many times, the level of detail on them is uh, is gone. So, well, I will study the diagram in more detail and come back to you in a moment once I've figured out 
which resistors in that diagram are what and then we will put our scope probe on that and measure the signal directly coming out the oscillator buffer amplifier and then we will calibrate the tuning capacitor which is here um, that little tuning capacitor to get the center frequency at 200 megahertz bang on and we will uh, come back very shortly right we're back again um, we have uh, a bit more information uh, to inform you when you uh, adjust this oscillator tuning cap to give you 200 megahertz uh, when you sample it on pin 2 of the IC10 uh, what happens is, is if you switch the if you've, if you've got it in lock and it's giving 200 megahertz as we saw earlier on the spectrum analyzer everything's unky dory uh, you can do self tests it'll all pass and everything but you switch the test set off and back on again uh, run the self test again and it'll fail on the same ones as it did before and the reason for that is is because this capacitor isn't quite tuned properly uh, what you tend to find is as you tune the capacitor you'll see the frequency of the spectrum analyzer be off quite a while away from 200 megahertz and what it'll do it'll start to drift back as you adjust that cap and then it'll get to a point where it's a couple of um, kilohertz off 100 kilohertz off whatever and then suddenly it'll move to 200 megahertz bang on and it's in lock it's sort of controlling it and no matter what you do with the capacitor then it'll not go off for 200 megahertz until you get it right the way around then it'll suddenly jump off again but basically once it's got it in lock it stays in lock now if you switch the tester off and then switch it back on again remember to put an RF frequency in and the RF generator of less than 80 megahertz I put 5 megahertz in so it definitely switches this oscillator on then you'll find that then the oscillator isn't at 200 megahertz it's gone off frequency again and then if you run your self test it'll fail them all again and the reason being is because this cap needs tuning a bit more and you tune it bit by bit uh, until you get it on 200 megahertz each time switch the test it off switch it back on go to the RF gen set the frequency to 5 megs again come back and check to see whether this is doing 200 megahertz and I've had to do it about three or four times where the just very fine adjustments on the capacitor so that when you do switch it off and switch it back on again eventually you'll find it'll be at 200 megahertz as soon as you switch it on I'm going to look in the service manual now to see if I can find a procedure for setting that up but in the absence of a procedure in the manual that's what I've done anyway to uh, make it um, you know work properly um, because it's not a it hasn't got a wide capture range most VCOs and synthesizers in radio telecoms equipment such as transceivers have a wide capture range and if the frequency has gone way off frequency say by a megahertz or so it'll be enough to be able to pull it in it'll, it'll capture it it's within its capture range um, because they tend to be fairly wide on radio transceivers and if the, if the oscillator is way off it'll grab it yank it back to the frequency and hold it there and the control voltage will adjust accordingly I think this oscillator has got a fairly narrow capture range which means when you turn the power on to the circuit turn the tester on select 5 megahertz the power switched on by that TR6 to the oscillator the oscillator starts to run but if it's too way off frequency either up or down I think what happens is it can't capture it it, it just can't grab it and then pull it into frequency so that's why you need to adjust this C um, 79 or whatever it is to um, bring the frequency of the oscillator to 200 megahertz where it captures it you'll see it'll jump straight across back to 200 megs and it gets about 10 kilohertz within frequency woof like that and stays at 10 meg uh, 200 megs but you have to switch it off switch it on a couple of times and then do the adjustment in between so um, I knew adjustments and then eventually when you turn it back on it'll stay on 200 megahertz so I'm going to look in the manual and see whether there's any uh, description about that. Right, I found a section in the service manual uh, which talks about checking the 200 megahertz oscillator. Um, 
which is this it says set the 2955 frequency to 20 megahertz and check that TR6 is switched on um, then it says connect the counter to the junction of C57R37 and check for 200 megahertz it says if a frequency does not lock the oscillator will require adjustment see 200 megahertz oscillator setting below before proceeding well I, I can't seem to find that see that 200 megahertz oscillator setting below so I'm, I'm just gonna have another look see if I can search through because there's uh, you know about 400 pages to this manual but uh, that's effectively what we've done in the in the last measurement so I'll come back shortly with uh, some more details on that setting Hello there, we're back now after doing uh, some more measurements and uh, run the self tests. As you can see, they all pass now. Uh, we'll just run another another self test. All tests, and we'll see what uh, what what happens. And uh, touch wood, fingers crossed. You know, they'll all, they'll all pass, not fail. <laughs> but uh, that seems to have been the the repair seems to have worked as for the 200 megahertz oscillator uh, setting as it says in the manual I couldn't find anything in particular that stands out about that it just mentions about measuring the the frequency at a particular point and adjusting the tuning capacitor um, so I, again quite uh, quite interesting so I should just uh, look at some of the theory and description in the manual and I'll come back